to have a son who's now converted to Islam. What was your initial reaction to that? It isn't religion that makes a good person. I said it's the person that makes a good religion. Are you a billionaire? Yes, and I'm a real billionaire. I can justify it, explain it, and it's checkable. Are travellers natural entrepreneurs and hustlers? Absolutely. If I was on a desert island, I'd want a traveller up beside of me because we survive and thrive, and that's a fact. If you bleed, they will bleed. We are the most underappreciated race of people. Billionaire, gypsy, businessman. Alfie Best joins me for a part two. We talk all things charity, his up and coming documentary, business, and multiple other things. Be happy, never content, and make sure you subscribe. Right, welcome back to the podcast, The Steve and Sully Study. We're at my second home in Mayfair, Woodbury House Art Gallery. I've got a fantastic guest in front of me, Mr. Alfie Best Sr., Thank you very much for this part two, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, Alfie Best Senior couldn't make it, but I came instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you very much, Steve. It's always a pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed our podcast that we did before. Um, got some fantastic feedback from it, to be fair, where a lot of people found it very, very honest and brutal. Not just from me, from yourself as well. That was the feedback that I got. So maybe there's a, a refreshing light that I'm back here. It's crazy to think that was in 2019 when we recorded it, and here we are today, 2023. It just proves how quickly time does go. It proves how time flies. But the other thing is as well, that um, like-minded people always flock together. Correct. Right, so when I first interviewed you, you were very successful, like you are today, but one thing has slightly changed in the media, which is your title. And it says this, you are the richest gypsy, or let's just say you are the first billionaire gypsy in the UK. Are you a billionaire? Yes. And I'm a real billionaire. In other words, I can justify it, explain it, and it's checkable. And a lot of people may find that vulgar. They might find it, you know, obtuse. But the facts are this, I have a company that has a value that's worth 1.2 billion pounds. How's it worth 1.2 billion pounds? We have 875 million pounds worth of assets. We have 100 million pounds worth of borrowing. So that makes our assets in the business alone worth 770 million, excluding our debt. And the rest, is goodwill, profit forecasted, so it easily tops £1.2 billion. Pounds. Mm. Okay, by the obvious, since 2019, what I mean by obvious is uh, net worth, the company assets going up, good debt, staff, etc. What else has changed with you personally and on the business front since 2019, Alfie? I've started to understand and value my own worth a lot more. Whereas before, um, I, up until that point, and I was slowly changing coming to that point, I thought with a poor mindset, not a wealthy mindset. Now a poor mindset is that you absolutely trust nobody. You think that every opportunity is a con. Everybody is only there to line their own pockets. That's a poor mindset. Because when you come from a poor background, that's pretty much what it is. Where a wealthy mindset is they embrace every opportunity. They look at the good people that are around them that are bringing great investments. And that's where I've changed. Mm, interesting. Do you know, like, you know, I watch you on social media. I've listened to countless amount of your podcasts. Um, I've obviously interviewed your son twice. So I feel like I've really got to know you, certainly from a TV podcast standpoint and having a, you know, a couple of conversations yep. over WhatsApp. And it, it, it's like you do have it, have it all. And I know that's not come through without sacrifice. Why do you keep on still today coming onto podcasts like mine to share your story, what, what's the benefit of that? The benefit for me is threefold. One 
it's free publicity. And two, I actually genuinely get to see people out there and say to them, anything's achievable. I get told that I'm a great success, which is wrong. I'm only a success today. Tomorrow can be something totally different. Look at COVID. Look at Brexit. They destroyed businesses overnight. You know, we have to remember the sun shines, but it rises and falls. And tomorrow's a new day every day. That's success. Just because it rises doesn't mean to say it's not going to set. So they're important to keep in mind. Um, the other reason for me coming on here, if I manage to break the glass ceiling, which we have in this country, for people like me that are from the street, you know, from a, a poor background, to say that we can change our life, we can change as a person. Would I say I'm a better person than what I was 40 years ago? Actually, yes. Yeah, because I can afford to be a better person. I can afford to be more charitable. I can afford to give more time to people. I can afford to help more people. You can't do that when you're poor. Mm, definitely. It's a lot harder to do that. Mm. Um, being a billionaire now, okay, how important was it to become a billionaire? And have you got your sight set on becoming 10 times over a billionaire? There is no limit to the level of finance that I want to go to. Does it make you a different person? I think it puts you in a different mindset. It allows you to look at bigger deals. It allows people's perception of you is different. Um, but how important was it for me? It was massively important. Why was it massively important? Because I'm financially driven. I'm financially motivated. You know, a lot of people will frown on that. Oh, what a, what a sorryful state. And, you know, well, if it wasn't from people like me speaking up and saying, you know, come on, this is there for the world. This is there for everybody. We'd still have the stiff upper lip and say, oh, how vulgar, my dear chap. Yeah, that's because you were born with it. That's because you were given it. You didn't have to scrape the barrel. You know, I hear a lot of people that say that new wealth is ostentatious and thrown in people's faces. And old wealth is matured and held back. No, it's because they're frightened. It's because they're frightened to speak out because they think they're going to be robbed. And not just by the people on the street, by the government. That's the fact of it. We're not allowed to celebrate here. We're not allowed to celebrate here. Our taxing system, wealthy people get taxed at 40%, but everybody doesn't realise that they get taxed at 40%. It's called death duties. When you die, they get to take 40% of your home. So why should we not celebrate our you know, successes? Why should we not celebrate people and, you know, my heroes are not sporting stars. My heroes are Richard Branson, Alan Sugar. They're my heroes mm. that actually had the gall to speak out. Since our podcast, um, I know back then you had a Bugatti, a Bugatti Veyron. And then since our podcast, you've now got another Bugatti called a Chiron. Which one do you prefer, the Veyron or Chiron? The Veyron is like driving a real animal. It is just an animal. Driving the Chiron is like driving a polished animal. That's the way I would describe it. Right. The Veyron is like just a muscle car that you just feel could fly. The Chiron's refined. So like I would describe it as, um, I'm trying to find, put it into words like, the, Veyr the Veyron is just a muscle car. The Chiron's polished. So it's not got that, you know, 
you actually feel six foot eight in the Veyron, in the Chiron, you could drive it to the shops. Does that? Yeah, I think you described it last time as uh, the Veyron, or in another podcast, is a brutal, brutal race car. And then you've also got the Chiron, which is also a very brutal uh, race car, but it's like a Rolls Royce version. Absolutely. Yeah. That's spot on. It's yeah. polished. They've refined it. But if you ask me which car I'd rather drive, it really depends which mood I'm in. Hmm. And since 2019, I believe you've also acquired a boat, a yacht, yeah. Sunseeker from Rat, yeah. and then also a helicopter. What do you prefer out of those two, the helicopter or the Sunseeker? The helicopter really has helped our business massively because I can visit eight parks in one day, not eight parks in one week. And that, so the way I look at it, it's as close as I'm ever going to get to a time machine. You know, that's that's the difference. That there, so for me, from a personal point of view, the helicopter, 10 times over. Um, have you ever had any near experiences like crashes in a helicopter? In 2018, just before we did our previous, I had a... Um, a uh, helicopter crash in a Robinson when I was learning to fly. Um, and, you know, we hit the ground. We, we were a thousand feet up. We hit the ground very badly. Um, that was pretty well pilot error on my part. And we had uh, uh, a real rear rotor failure. Cool. I bet, uh, did it make you nervous getting back into the helicopter? I always wear brown trousers now when I fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay, so I've got a quote here from your own website. Treat, I treat my business just like a lady with honour, respect and integrity. I love that saying. Tell me a bit more about what you mean. Let me say, look, a woman is like money. It's exactly like money. If you lend it, if you let somebody else spend it, if you let somebody else take it out, if you're disrespectful with it, it will leave you. Money does exactly the same. A woman will do exactly the same. But if you respect it, if you love it, if you treat it with care, if you don't let anybody else take it out, if you don't let anybody else spend it, it won't leave you. If you learn how to invest it and invest in it, it will grow with you. And that's the same as a woman. Definitely. And vice versa, a man with a woman. If a woman invests in her man, she helps support her man. She respects her man. Respect is everything. Then he will grow with her. Very true. So over the 2020 period, lockdown, there was carnage in the media. Some people didn't really, didn't get faced by it. And some people were genuinely worried. Um, I've got my own version of it and I'm pretty sure you, you have. But as far as the business side was concerned, what did you learn in that uncertain time? How did you pivot? How did you, did you adapt? How did you become stronger in uncertainty? I learned three things from that. Number one, the people that we look to lead us are simple people. And the moment that they're, something's thrown in their wake that they know they've never dealt with before, they're just simple human beings. Because I've never seen so many prime ministers and presidents running for the hills and running for covers and making bad decisions. So that opened my eyes these people are not what they're selling themselves to be. Number two, when the uh, COVID was on, rightly or wrongly, we just carried on as normal. I got a lot of bad criticism for it. But how I looked at it, if my business were going to fail, they were going to be failing because of me, not because of 
some government telling me what I can do and what I can't do to shut me down. You know, what they did to the pub industry was disgraceful. Disgraceful. And I hope that the people that had pubs sue the government because it was on the government response that they shut and they closed. What should have happened, what they did, what the government did was this. They decided your business should close. And other businesses they decided should thrive. And I'll give you an example. Pubs should not have closed. What should have happened is this. They should have said to pubs, you cannot have people congregating together. I get that. But all people can only buy their alcohol from pubs, which are licensed, but they cannot consume it on the premises. That's what should have happened. They can do delivery services and people can collect. But they didn't do that. What they did was said, the pubs have got to close and you can still buy your alcohol from the superstore. So the superstores, alcohol went through the roof. Their profits went through the roof. So the government created famine and feast. You know, they created that caravan parks had to close. I got fined, me personally, because I was visiting my own parks. How much was the fine? £50 a day. Happy to pay it. If I was going to fail, I was going to fail on my own means. You know, how I looked at it, these, I'm not saying that it couldn't have been worse. I'm not saying that what they were doing wasn't for the right thing. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But I do think that I know a little bit about business. And you don't just close businesses and then tell another business you're taking all their trade. It wasn't thought through very well. What actually should have happened is the superstores should not have been able to sell alcohol. And the only place you could have bought alcohol should have been from a pub and consumed it at home. That would have saved those businesses. Mm, agreed. Your take on, because I like what you said, you know, the moment that adversity shows its ugly head, these, you know, high profile governments, politicians suddenly just become normal people and they're panicking like a rabbit in head headlights. And there was obviously certain things that happened that was completely conflicting to the message that they were giving the general public. Stay at home, stay only within your bubble, but yet you had governments doing parties and also Matt Hancock kissing a lady, who I even forgot her name, in the corridor somewhere. When you saw Matt Hancock kissing her and it was a completely different message he was doing physically, what was your initial thoughts? Nothing. How I look at it, if you really think that that is just an enclosed incident, take the blinkers off. That, that goes on in Parliament every day. It goes on in offices every day. I thought nothing of it, you know, and I actually felt that, you know, Matt Hancock shouldn't have been, you know, held over the coals for that. What he should have been held over the coals for was not groping up his, the, the woman that he's working with or, you know, that's, I'm not interested in what his private life's about. I'm interested in can he do the job that he's supposed to be in there to do. You know, like, I hear so much more about Boris Johnson's party than what the real reason was. I couldn't care if he has five parties or ten. What I care about is he's telling me not to have one and then having one. Correct. That's the point. Mm. Don't be a hypocrite. And I see so many people that are, you know, righteous, that, you know, don't do that. Do as I say, don't do as I do. And I think, uh, you know, general public should open their eyes and realise, you know, we are actually being governed not guided. We're being governed, not guided. That doesn't sit well with me. No. 
And look, I know when I do these sorts of podcasts and I say these sorts of things, these are the sort of thing that government, oh, they don't like, well, come on, my God, can't have, can't have that. Look at Andrew Tate. Do I agree with what Andrew Tate says? 60% of it, yes. Do I agree with his delivery? No, I don't. Don't be obtuse and don't, you know, don't tell everybody else, you know, that they're brokies and I don't like that. You know, so was he once. So was I once. Don't ram that down people's throats. You know, embrace them, bring them forward. But I do agree with 60% of what he says. Um, do I agree with his delivery? No. And I think it was his delivery that caused him the problems that he's got. Mm, yeah. On the note of uh, Prime Minister, government, you being a sophisticated business person, you being positive, you just being a rational, logical thinker, that's the aura I get from you every time I speak to you. Do you think you could be Prime Minister of the UK? I think anything is possible. Anything is possible. But one of the things that we've got to overcome before somebody like me could ever potentially become Prime Minister is the, the conception that you've got to be at Oxford. The conception that you've got to go to Cambridge. Now, we've got our first Asian Prime Minister in British history. I was hoping that this was really going to be a turning curve for the UK. Because the one thing that I love about the Asian community is the mothers and fathers that came here, came here looking for a new life. They came here, and the reason, and if I can be a little bit condescending, when you take the corner shops that they opened, the reason they made them pay is they didn't work 10 hours. They worked 24 hours. So it was like having two businesses in one. And I was hoping that our new Prime Minister had that entrepreneurial spirit. At the moment, I don't see it. So I was really hoping that, you know, th this, this was going to, like when Donald Trump first came in to uh, the US, I actually think he could have went down as one of the greatest Prime Ministers. Uh, sorry, Apologies. One of the greatest presidents. But his failing was he was too in love with himself. And you've got to, I think, in politics, I believe, you do have to be, not for the people, but for your country. That's what you should be for. Because if you support your country, your country can support its people. And I don't want to be governed. I want to be guided. We need to support more of our entrepreneurs. We should be supporting more of our businesses. And I think actually more employees are now embracing the word team and realising that if you support your business, your business will support you. Definitely. On that note of business, what have you invested into? What have you started since we last spoke in 2019? We've, look, my whole guidance within my business, and I use that as a word, is to be different, to accept who we are. Now that's, if I can explain that comment, I've used two anomalies that are completely different. I said to be different, but to be who you are. Because most people are always trying to be something else that they're not. And I actually genuinely believe that everybody is born with a fantastic talent. Some people through their life get to find it and some people don't. But the one thing that we can never be sure of is at what time in our life we could find it. Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken didn't find his till he was 62. Morgan Freeman, somebody said to him, are you not disappointed that fame came so late in life at 55? He said, hell no, it didn't have to come at all. 
So it's about finding that thing that really gives us a spark. So what I now do is put people under pressure in our company. And I am privileged to say 90% of them deal with that pressure and grow. And while they're growing, the business grows with them because they believe in what we're doing. We're changing people's lives. So in answer to your question, I've learned how to fan the flame a little bit more. I've learned how to fan people's flame a little bit more. And it makes the fire burn bright. Yeah. So you and your son, Alfie Best Jr., who's been on the podcast twice, he's a fantastic fella. I've got a lot of time for it for him. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm in, into business, I'm into boxing, and he obviously ticks many of those boxes. Um, you're known as the CEO founder of Wild Crest Park Homes, and it's wildly successful, and it just keeps on building and building and building and building, which is unbelievable to see. Thank you. Then you've got your son that has kind of very different businesses. So on one hand, sometimes the message I get from entrepreneurs is stick to what you know, grow it out and become uber successful at that and then other things will fall into place. But then other people, like a Richard Branson, for example, has multiple different sectors that he's put the Virgin brand on. And I guess Alfie Best Jr. is kind of a little bit going down that road. What is the better route? Is it to flourish in one thing, stick to what you know, or diverse your efforts into multiple different businesses. Okay. You're describing two different people. You're describing a businessman and you're describing an entrepreneur. Okay. An entrepreneur is a GP. He's a general practitioner. He knows a little bit about your eyes, a little bit about your nose, a little bit about your heart, a little bit about your knee. He's a general practitioner. A businessman is a surgeon. He's an expert in heart surgery. He is dynamic in that. Two of the greatest people that I could tell you about, one as a businessman and one as an entrepreneur, is Jeff Bezos. He's built the biggest online shop store. And to me, he's the greatest genius that's ever walked. Because you could have done what he did. And so could I. He sold books online and has created Amazon. Now you have Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a true engineer and entrepreneur. He has made many different businesses successful. That makes him a true entrepreneur. Does that sort of sum it up? It does. So you have to look at what a businessman is and what an entrepreneur is. Alfie... He's a true entrepreneur. He's not frightened to go outside his comfort zone. He's not frightened to try something new, put his heart behind it. But don't try and be an entrepreneur if you're a businessman. Don't try and be a, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, a businessman if you're an entrepreneur. Do what, do what your skill set says you, can, you are, what you're good at, what, you know, fans the flame of the fire. Um, being a billionaire now and being very successful and being in the public domain, you're on, you know, Sunday Times Rich List, you're on multiple different TV shows, you've been on lots of podcasts, you've got some phenomenal write-ups about you. I mean, you can't escape that you are successful, not just financially, but even your, your, your personal profile. It's great. There's an upside to that for Alfie, your son. There's probably a downside to it. What is the upside? And what is the downside? In everything in life, there is highs and lows. In relationships, there are highs and there are lows. In drugs, there are highs and lows. In drink, there are highs and lows. So Alfie stepping into my shadow has taken more gall, courage, determination, to dim my light, which he hasn't done. He's actually shone in his own light. Most sons cannot shine until their father's light dims. How proud am I? Mm. He's actually stepped forward and helped me blossom my own light while shining his own. 
didn't come into my business and say, I'm working with my dad. Now, he learned along the way. Have I been a difficult and a hard father? Yeah. Really hard. Because anybody can be an easy father and just give. It takes a man with courage, discipline to be hard. Because everybody wants their children to have what they didn't have. Do better than them. Well, easy times create easy people. Hard times create hard people. Well, uh, so if I was a fly on the wall and you being his father, let's rewind the clock a little bit. And Alfie Best Jr. is 10, 12, 15. You know, now he's a teenager and he's turned into a, a young professional or an adult. What's the kind of language, the kind of communication between you two? What kind of advice was you giving him when he was growing up? Unfortunately, I can't say that I was the best father in the world because I wasn't. I was a hard father. You know, at 10 years old, he was in the boxing club with me and we were in the boxing club four days a week. Really were. Um, and at 13, he was in his own van with a driver, knocking doors, selling rubble bags, selling toilet rolls, selling uh, builder sacks and driving out and selling them every day. But he had to put fuel in the van, insure the van, and pay a driver. That's a lot for somebody of 13. I think I could have, would I have done it differently? The answer is yes, I would have done it differently. And I think I would have been more nurturing as opposed to being a father and telling. That I think I would have done. But so far, it appears that what I did worked. Definitely. So far. Tomorrow's a different day. But mm -hmm. so far, I have somebody that now stands in his own right, runs his own businesses, and still is trying. Where actually, he doesn't have to. And that's how most people would see it. You know, so we're all learning and we're all growing, me included. Yeah. The one more thing about Alfie, actually, you've probably been asked this a bunch of times. I asked him point blank when he came onto the podcast for a second time, his conversion to Islam and being Muslim. I, when, I, when people talk about certain individuals, including yourself, there's obviously a lot of good stuff, but I see you as the old school. And what I mean by old school is positive, get up, crack a dawn, work your socks off and just keep on plowing forward. And... I feel like you're a bit like my dad, whereas, you know, you're tough. No, no matter what people say say to you, you just sort of brush it off and carry on. Whereas today's culture is a little bit different. It's a bit snowflakey, if I'm being honest, and we can talk about that later on. <laughs> to, for an uh, old school guy to have a son who's now converted to Islam, everyone can do what they want. But what was your initial reaction to that? Well, I spoke to Alfie before he converted. And, he, and, uh, and we spoke about it a couple of days beforehand. Um, and I said, is this what you want to do? He said, um, yeah. He said, uh, he said, he said, it is. I said, okay. Said, well, if you feel that's the right choice, no problem. He said, what's your view? I said, it isn't religion that makes a good person. I said, it's the person that makes a good religion. I said, there are bad people in all religions. Um, do I think it's helped Alfie? Answer, no. Do I think it's made him worse? No. But what I do think it has given him is a guideline to help him pull things out of the Quran and work along that religion. So is it a good thing? So far, you know, I'm, there's as many bad Muslims as what there are bad Christians, bad Catholics, bad Hindus. How do I know? It's because I've worked with Muslims. My MD is a Muslim. Um, I'm as close to him as anybody. 
So it's not the religion that makes the person. It's the person that makes the religion. Good person's a good person. A bad person's a bad person. That's it. Did you, you know, being from the traveller background, I think I mentioned to you before, I, I box. I've had 16 boxing fights. My last one was last year. And if you're in the boxing world, pro, you know, or you're doing amateur, you're going to come across travellers because they're very good boxers and they're, and they're great. And it's really, really good and sometimes tough and frightening to spar against them. And one thing I said to you last time on the podcast is, there's a couple of elements, a couple of characteristics and traits travellers got from my perspective. They're loyal, they've got great culture, they're hard nut people, they work really, really hard. But was it a bit of a shock when they found out that Alfie Best Jr. had been converted to Muslim? Was yeah. there a bit of an uproar? And did you get some of that backlash? Uh, listen, you're always gonna get a few haters, always. Anybody with an open mind would would em, embrace why someone's done it. Um, so th there was a lot of people that genuinely supported Alfie. And I've got a fantastic partner that, I, that I'm working with in another business. Actually, two partners, to be fair. And it was unbelievable the support that they showed they're from the traveling background they're devout catholics but when somebody tried to have a little sly dig they go look hold on it's not for me becoming a muslim but what difference does it make you should be supporting him on his journey you don't know what what space he's in and i thought that was quite prevalent especially coming from a real hard you know, background of where they were from. So I was that, that get, you get to really see, and I did, you get to see the people that are for you and the people that are against you. It's actually quite a nice thing. Um, I touched on this last time, but I'm going to slightly diff, do a different variation of, of the question. So travellers, they've, they've got this, get on with it mentality, which again, I love. And I think more and more people, especially younger people today, need to do that because they look at people's social media and they want it tomorrow. And unfortunately, some of them go down the wrong path to get it tomorrow and they end up doing the wrong thing. I think if you're dedicated and you've got this positive mindset, you set goals and ambitions and you have a great team around you, you can achieve anything. Are travellers natural entrepreneurs and hustlers? Absolutely. If I was on a desert island or in a country just dropped there, I'd want a traveller up the side of me because we survive and thrive. And that's a fact. The one, these are our strengths. We're loyal. We believe in our families and support them. If you bleed, they will bleed and they will bleed with you. They won't run for the hills. They will have your back no matter what. That's a fact. Don't get me wrong. There are good and bad. But 90%, we are the most underappreciated race of people that is in existence. And I'll prove it. Tyson Fury was hated. Billy Joe Saunders. They never got the, rec the recognition that they should be. How do I know? I don't see any Nike sponsoring Tyson. I don't see Under Armour sponsoring Tyson. Whereas, forgive me for saying this, but Anthony Joshua had all of those sponsors. Now that, to me, speaks realms. Whereas, I actually think Tyson Fury is pretty much... One of the great, he's certainly the greatest heavyweight Britain has ever produced, ever produced. And I think he has the chance to be one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. I really do. You know, is he there yet? Look, he's well on his way. You know, well on his way. Um, you've got other gypsies. Charlie Chaplin, Yul Brynner, Elvis Presley, Mother Teresa. 
And here's one most people don't know. President Bush. All came from gypsies. But did they celebrate it? You don't hear Michael Caine or Bob Hoskins celebrating that they were from the gypsy community. Why? Because of the stigma that's just attached to it. So I'm pretty well as a businessman, the only gypsy that came out and kicked the door down and said, you know, love me or hate me, this is what I am. And I have things, you know, I've had things text to me on social media. How can you, how can you celebrate liars, cheats and thieves? And, you know, on some of them, I'll, I'll send a reply back if I feel like it. And on this one, I did. I said, thank you. But when you're poor, starving, you'll do anything to survive. Most of you gorgeous, I couldn't help myself, I apologise. Most of you gorgeous would do the same. Because when you're on your knees, you'll do anything to get up. In the film Alive, where the plane crashes, people turn to cannibals, eating each other to survive. You'll be surprised to do what you have to do. To be, so when we criticise people for, and stereotype them, they're not helping themselves because what they're not doing is giving those people a chance to actually shine. I know you're a, a friend of Tyson Fury and I was going to ask you a couple of questions just about the, the, the boxing. Uh... Look, we've spoke, we're not actually friends. We've spoke a couple of times. Okay. And you've um, gone to a few of his fights in Vegas, etc. Yeah, look, I, 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 why would I not support Tyson Fury? Why would I not support Billy Joe Saunders? You know, there are some of the greatest athletes we have. Billy Joe Saunders, I think, is going to come back. And I think he's going to have some great fights. And I don't think we've seen the best of him. Mm. Well, he's doing fantastic, wasn't he, against Canelo? He's yeah. just that his, his eye got uh, badly injured, but he was he was he was putting on a great, great performance, and it was very, very tight until that moment. So, who would win, Fury or Joshua? I have no doubt Fury will beat Joshua comfortably. Comfortably, he has the style. He has the style to beat Joshua. Joshua, in my opinion, is a great heavyweight. No question about it, is a great heavyweight. And I absolutely implore that man to come back great because he's had this time out and I think he will come back great. But stardom and celebrityism, I feel, can make you weak. It makes you weak mentally because you then end up with a lot of people around you saying yes and agreeing to you when they shouldn't be agreeing to you. And they should be telling you that makes you weak. It doesn't make you strong. Mm. People around you, and I, and I think that happened with Joshua. But in answer to your question, I think that Tyson just has the tools to beat Joshua comfortably. And that's not because Tyson's a traveller, just the way I see it. If I look back in history, the only person I feel that had a very similar style in the heavyweight division as Tyson Fury is Muhammad Ali. I think, look, Muhammad Ali wasn't just a great boxer. He was a great human being. He was a great man. And there was one thing that he said, which endeared me to him um, as one of the greatest learners, and I use the word learners, of all time. He was very anti-white in his early days. And he felt that the white Americans had persecuted the black Americans. And let's be honest, in slavery they did. But he did an interview and he said, 
When I was younger, I thought the devil was white. He said, I now realise the devil comes in all colours. And that goes back to what I said earlier. Good person's a good person. A bad person's a bad person. Creed, colour, race or religion. It's the person that's good, not the surroundings around them. Absolutely. Or bad, not the surroundings around them. In that fantasy fight between Muhammad Ali and Tyson Fury, who would you put your money on? I'd have to go with Muhammad Ali. I'd have to go with Muhammad Ali. But with all great fighters, with all great fighters, when are we matching them? Are we matching them at both when they're at their prime? For instance, if you take Tyson, uh, Mike Tyson, for me, I think he's the greatest fighter of all time, even better than Muhammad Ali. I just think he was, but he was a fighter that matured. You know, you look, have you seen the picture of Muhammad Ali when he was 13 and Mike Tyson when he was 13? You've got to look at it. It's like, whoa, Muhammad Ali is a boy. Mike Tyson was a man. He's the youngest man to ever win the world heavyweight title. You know, like, um, so for me, I think Mike Tyson is the greatest heavyweight to ever walk in a pair of shoes in his prime. But again, what killed him? Being a celebrity. Mm. The moment he had Customata around him, keeping him grounded, not letting him, the moment all of a sudden he got into the world of Don King, he got beat. Because mm. you're a boxing man. Frank Warren or Eddie Hearn, who's a better promoter? I think they're both great promoters. I think they're both great promoters. I know Barry Hearn quite well. So that would always end up leading me towards Eddie. The reason being because of a loyalty to Barry. But if I can put that loyalty to one side, I think they're both businessmen and they would both do the, the best for themselves, not necessarily for their fighters, because fighters come and go. They're a commodity. And you've got to understand... They're in business. I want to ask you one more thing about the boxing world. Uh, something that happened quite recently. The whole Conor Ben. Um, I don't want to call it a scandal because I'm going to say a scandal in inverted co commas because that's how the media has portrayed it. And then on social media, people have got comments for and against what happened. What do you make of that situation? I think... You'll never know the truth. But I don't believe that Conor Ben would be that naive to take substances that he knows he's not going to get found out about. That's my real genuine belief. Don't forget, we have had so many of these scandals. Um, I'm gutted for Conor Ben and Eubanks because... This would have been a trilogy for them. And this would have cemented their history. Everybody wanted to see the fights. From my age to your age. So this would have been, this would have catapulted them. Because you'd have had this trilogy, father and son, father and son. And then potentially, son, uh, grandson. And you, This could have been... So it's a shame the fight didn't happen. Um, could it happen? Yes, it could. But it won't be the same fight. Not now. Do you, because I'm hearing now through forums and through other conversations, and some of it's probably a load of garbage, but some of it probably has some truth in it. You only have to look at the Canelo situation when he apparently got found out because he was eating certain meat. And then it was enhancing substances in there. He only got a little bit of a, a fine or a little bit of a laying off and he was back in the ring within six months or whatever. And then you look at other fighters. 
I mean, going back to Tyson Fury, that he wasn't taking sports enhancing drugs, but he was taking things like cocaine, etc. And he got a massive, massive ban. So is it, do you believe that sports enhancing drugs or steroids is happening with these elite fighters behind the scenes and they just know how to I, get around the laws? Right, okay. This is, what, this is what I would say. I genuinely believe that you would be shocked at what we're all eating. <laughs> and I really mean that. I think you would be, I think if we knew half of what we were eating, we wouldn't eat it. From the chickens being inflated to being, you know, I was, I was at um, a factory where I saw them physically washing chicken with water, washing, the, washing chickens with water and I see this with my own eyes, but actually the, the chickens are being inflated. And I thought, wow, no, it, it's, a, it's, 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 a, I'm talking about water, and, but it made the chicken look more wholesome. So do I think, I think, look, there's a lot of products in different foods we wouldn't even know we're eating. Do I think that fighters are actively out there cheating, actually taking drugs? Actually, no, I don't. I really don't. I don't want that to sound naive because the tests are too draconian. I think in boxing, they've pretty well got that nailed because they... they now, but on the other hand, do I think in that they're taking the right nutrients, eating the right foods, which are enhancing? Yes, I do. So that's not me having a cop out. That's me saying, do I think they're taking drugs and enhancing themselves? No, because I think they'll get found out. There's too many fighters that get found out and they're actually innocent in the first place. Hmm. So what's next for you? I know you've been on the ITV undercover, Big Boss. There's been plenty of other channels, uh, sorry, TV programs. What do you think you're going to do next? Well, we're launching the documentary, or we're not, but sorry. The production company is launching the uh, film documentary called The Gypsy Billionaire, which is about my life that gets launched in Cannes. Um, I watch it and I find it a little bit surreal because I, I don't actually think my life is really that interesting or there's much of a story to it. Um but because anybody could do what I've done, anybody could do what I've done. Um, same as we just sat here and said, could anybody do what Jeff Bezos did? The answer is yes. You know, I wish I'd have thought about selling books online. Maybe I'd have never got to the Amazon biggest online store in the world, but I'd have certainly got to the Amazon online bookstore of worldwide sales. And that was the you know, the um, the footprint that took them to the online stores. Mm. So you're two hundredth and two hundred and thirtieth, I think, on the on the rich list. When I last checked, I could be wrong. I'm two hundred and thirtieth last year. Okay, I think I'm I've risen by a hundred million this year. Wow. So where's that put you in that rich list? I don't know. Honestly, so, don't know. So let's just say it was still at two thirty, but we know that's probably not accurate. Um, in the next five years from now, where would you like to be on that list? The goal is always to be number one. The goal is always to be number one. Um, but we have a business plan in place. That plan is like a machine. The businesses roll along. And with the good grace of God and a good wind, I believe within five years, we will double our wealth. That's if we don't have any hiccups along the way and business carries on as it is. It's taken me 20 years to get to the wealth we have now, which is 1.2 billion. But that was from a standing start. I'm now running. So I should be able to close the gap. The business is growing to the tune of 70 million every year and that's based on where we sit today and that's without us further investing that's just on what the company earns 
what the company's planning growth is and what the uplift in the value of our properties are and the uplift in the value of the business every year. What do you fear? Going bust. Going bust. And is is that is that is that a healthy fear thinking or reminding yourself you could go bust? Yes, for some people. No, for some people. For me, yes. Because it never lets me forget where I come from. And what and when I say that phrase, I don't mean it tongue in cheek. It physically reminds me. Number two, your fears can do two things. Drive you or destroy you. I allow my fears to drive me. Just like a boxer getting in a ring. If a boxer gets in a ring with no fear, he will have no edge. And the last couple of questions here, Alfie. If you were to give three fundamental basic bits of information to a business person stroke entrepreneur what would those three tips be trust no one and ask everybody never to trust you make sure you carry that through on everybody that you surround yourself with you never want people to become yes people you always want people to share their opinion if they're close enough to be next to you they should be close enough to be able to advise you whether or not you accept that advice and by more people not trusting you, it means they'll check for you. And while they're checking, it means you get it right so much more because we're not geniuses and things can go wrong and we can miss things. So all of my team are told, don't trust me, check for me. I came up with a quote, which I said to you last time, and it goes like this, be happy, never content. You had your own version of that back in 2019. The Alfie Best that we know today that is advanced. What does be happy, never content mean to you now? Be happy, never content. For me, it's about embracing the moment and enjoying what you have because it may leave you tomorrow. You know, like I've seen so many people say, oh, but you've made it now. Be careful you don't become somebody that just preserves wealth, not builds wealth. The worst thing that can happen by preserving wealth is that it no longer goes to work anymore. And you spend so much time worrying about how to preserve it instead of growing it. You can only do better. And I don't mean for yourself. I mean for the economy. I mean for the people around you by working to grow wealth. The moment you become complacent, so will your money and so will your business. Great bit of advice. Thank you very much for your time. I'm really, really, uh, you know, humbled that you came on for a second second time, Alfie. Hope to uh, stay connected with you. I never know, there could be some opportunities here at Woodbury House with you. Steve, it's always a pleasure. You're doing great things. And what I would say, if you haven't been to the gallery, this is a must. I spent 30 minutes coming through here and I was blown away by the knowledge of the art. Trust me, for a down-to-earth man to talk to in the art world, it's got to be Steve. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, share it, uh, subscribe and be happy, never content. Thank you very much again. Pleasure.